Okay, so um, what I was going to show you is a little bit about some of the work that's been done in ULAR with our colleagues in UEMS, with Simona's involvement, of course. Uh, and I was going to show you some of the things that we're trying to do to support training of rheumatologists across Europe. It's a jigsaw, and we want to put all the pieces together. We need a curriculum, we need exams, we need courses, we need a concentration on professional attributes, how we are with our colleagues and our patients, not just knowledge. And so some of those things I'm going to mention as I go through, uh, and actually, I was going to show you a little bit about developing standards for, for training rheumatologists. Um, but I'll, that's published, and I'll, I'll show you that quite quickly. You can look at the publication if you're interested. But I think it's fascinating to spend time listening to that last session and thinking about our motivation. So imagine the problem. You want to build a rheumatologist. You want to train a rheumatologist. What component parts do you need to put them together? Imagine that kit of Lego bricks to build some structure. Which bits do you need and how would you ensure it? And then the last thing that, uh, that I would want to say is that it's, um, and this is important politically and for people to feel part of this, that individual countries all train really good physicians, all train really good rheumatologists. What this is about is trying to learn from the best. In the UK setting, perhaps it helps us to deal with the people that are struggling in their training the most, rather than raise the best. The best will always get to the top, but some people struggle in their training for lots of reasons. How do we, how do we look after that? And, and trying to harmonize across Europe, which will allow people to move between European countries. So there's a number of different motivations, but it is not about Europe taking control of this from individual countries that will continue to provide the licensing, the legal responsibility to work within their countries. Okay, so ULAR has various different components. Uh, Anna Maria, past president, uh, mentioned this early in her little address. Uh, this is the education committee, strategic committee, a number of different members divided up into subcommittees which come up with ideas and deliver things. Online courses, live courses, and then training and CME. So now we're going to drift off into the territory of training. And of course, Simona's face is here because she is the current chair of the ULAR Education Committee. I was the previous and we worked together and it's a great pleasure to do that, Simona. So uh, Simona's here for the, her work in this area. Okay, so let's think about those component parts of getting uh, a rheumatologist. And you can see the nice, smiley, happy rheumatologist as we've just discovered all rheumatologists are. And then we look over onto the right-hand side and we think about if we were to develop a framework, what sorts of things would a rheumatologist have to know to be good at their job? There's medical knowledge, sure, but you need to think about quality and safety. You need to think about ethics and appropriate behavior professionally. We need to know a bit about health policy in our countries and across Europe and the world. We need some leadership skills. We need to be able to do research and teaching, all appropriate for the level needed for a rheumatologist. Now, this is a cartoon of what rheumatology training might be. This is not specific to any country, and you could slide these around to be appropriate in the UK or in Romania. Simona, Simona was telling me earlier that people have to make the decision to train as a rheumatologist quite early in, the, in their training. That's different to some countries. Um, but you might imagine that people go to medical school, at some point they do some internal medicine training, at some point they do rheumatology training, in some countries with internal medicine, in some countries they can be separate. You have to learn all of those things on the bottom, competency, skills, uh, and there are different courses and, and teaching strategies to allow that. And then some countries have examinations at various stages. So we usually have examine at the end of medical school. We usually have some sort of professional exam in internal medicine. And then some countries have an exam at the end. And I'm going to talk a bit about an exam at the end uh, and some of the work that's being done to develop that as well. Uh, and, and ULAR is trying to fill in some of these little gaps. 
So here's the sort of background to why this work might be useful. Um, a number of pieces of work have been done saying there is enormous variation in training across Europe. That's not necessarily in saying one is better than the other. That's saying it's just different and the amount offered is different. And we should reflect on that and look for best practice uh, and look for those areas that we might be able to improve. And it's also important to do this in conjunction with other organizations, national societies, UEMS that I'll come back to in a moment. This will be a familiar name to many of you, but I'll introduce UMS as a character uh, in this piece. And one of the things that we've been trying to do, particularly over the last few years, uh, is to work more clo closely EULA and UEMS together. So what's UEMS? UMS is this organization that's part of the EU. Of course, not all countries in, uh, uh, in EULA are part of the EU. Don't I know it as someone from the United Kingdom? And so it, we try to represent those views in countries that are not in the EU as well, and there are a number of those included. But UEMS is mandated by the European Union to look after, to have responsibility for training across different medical specialities in Europe. And they usually do two things. They have to set a curriculum at a European level, and they have a responsibility to provide an examination. They do other things as well, but that's their mandated responsibility from the European Union. Now, the other organization I'd like to uh, introduce you to is something called SESMA. SESMA is a part of UEMS. And SESMA is an organization that looks at ensuring the quality of examinations at a European level in medical specialities. And I think of the medical specialities in Europe, about 30 have a European speciality examination. It has no legal standing in most countries except where a country chooses to adopt it. But this standard is there, and there is a desire at a EU level and at a UEMS SESMA level for there to be common examinations across Europe that we become closer in our working in, and in our practice. Uh, and that leads me to a very small piece on just talking about uh, e examination. So in the absence of UEMS producing an examination, for several years, EULA has produced a small live examination to try and learn how to do this. And at the last EULA council meeting, funding was given to start to do this more properly in conjunction with UEMS and to involve a number of people um, in writing examinations, in setting high standards and starting to produce a European examination, which over the next two or three years will come to fruition, we hope. But this is an enormous piece of work, and it requires all of us to work together, to feel comfortable, to feel that our views are respected, to feel that UEMS are friends with each other, with uh, EULA and vice versa, uh, and that we're working well in an appropriate way. So that's just setting a background. And this would be a live, in-person exam taken in many different centers in Europe, an MCQ-type exam. But this is at the formulation stage. Right, I'm now going to spend a little bit of time talking about another piece of the jigsaw. The exam is one piece of the jigsaw. Courses are another piece of the jigsaw. And this is about uh, producing standards for training rheumatologists. This work has now been published, so I won't show it in enormous detail. Um, this work has been done in conjunction with UEMS, which is wonderful for those of us who work in positions within EULA. Uh, and there's been a really nice partnership here. And then UEMS has their mandate to produce what's called the European Training Requirement, ETR. And they will take these guidelines and all the work that's been done with EULA's resource and they will merge that into something that looks like the UEMS document. So there will be a European-wide guidance to the standards that should be achieved, the competencies at a European level, at least suggested at a European level. The superheroes on the right were to remind me that we all train good rheumatologists. No country has the monopoly on producing smart doctors, but we all do it slightly differently. And I learn whenever I go and see different places, and I think all of us can learn about how we do this. And there are also different belief systems. Some countries think exams are not important. They should test in the professional skills that individuals have. 
Some countries believe the exam is very important and there's variation, so lots of nice discussion. I think I'll just skip through some of these. Okay, so when deciding, so this was a ULAR task force, so you know the sort of thing, there's a steering committee, there's some funding, there's a few meetings, this was all going on during COVID, so the meetings were all virtual. Um, there's usually 25 people or so within a task force and you try to represent men, women, geographical areas, patients, healthcare professionals, and to try to get some sort of collective view and agreement. But here are some concepts. Now, many of you will help to produce um, guidelines, standards for how you train medical students in your, in your local universities. And here are some of the, the concepts which I've put to the concept of bookshelves, and I hope this translate, and the books, uh, bookshelves, uh, the books that are on those shelves. So the framework is the bookshelves, a framework for training. And we will divide it up into individual domains, which are the shelves, and then we'll divide it up into subsections as well in a moment, to get individual competencies, which are the individual books. Competencies, you'll know this com concept, People started talking about it educationally decades ago, the idea of being able to define things that professionals need to be able to do, and that competence often contains both knowledge, skills, and behaviours simultaneously in that competence to be able to deliver the competence. And I think the world increasingly moves towards competence. I've mentioned how the project was done. It's a standard ULAR project, and we start to fill in these individual frameworks. So first of all, the framework. These are a number of different frameworks that are used around the world. You can see UEMS at the top, competence-based knowledge, skills, uh, and competencies. The US competence-based, there's CANMEDS, which is often about the roles people have. Are you a leader? Are you a medical expert? Are you uh, a professional? Are, are you a scholar? Uh, and Australia, more competence base. And we decided to start again, and I've shown you this little umbrella already. It's simple concepts, but it's trying to get the idea of underneath that umbrella, to be a rheumatologist, we have to have medical expertise and all of these individual bits of our being to operate well as a rheumatologist. And then we can look and map a number of different organizations, all the different medical specialities we could think of across Europe, across America, Canada, and Australia. Don't look at the detail, but for those of you who are interested and want to develop exams or, or standards in your own organizations, this is all part of the supplementary material. The fellow Elisa Aluno did an enormous amount of work, and this is a resource for anyone to say, what's the state of play in all of these different educational systems, different specialities around the world? So I think it's a, it's a wonderful resource. And then we looked in more detail at a number of different national training documents that were selected broadly, as broadly as we could, depending on the type of documents that were available. And then we started to fill in the framework, the bookshelf. So first of all, domains. Here were the basic domains, basic activities, new onset patients with RMDs, emergencies, the management of chronic conditions, then about physician-patient relationships, working in teams, and then the other things we do, the research, teaching, and learning. Those are the domains, those are the shelves of the framework. Then within those shelves, there are core themes. And the core themes, and, and once again, this is in a publication, so I, I won't read this all. This is the end of the day, at the end of a three-day conference. But just to signal you to some of these, domain one, basic activities in rheumatology. Core themes, 1A, history taking and physical examination. 1B, interventional and investigational procedures related to RMDs. And you can imagine in this process, we had lots of discussion, lots of fights, lots of which words, what should be included, how do we get this as simple as possible, how do we make this understandable to people from multiple different educational systems in different countries to come to some sort of consensus. And then, of course, come uh, the domain, the, the, from the domains come the core themes, and from the core themes we have to divide those into the individual books, and those are the individual competencies. Now, at various stages, this was checked with a number of stakeholders. So this went back to a survey to 500-odd people, 
uh, most of whom were rheumatologists, but trainees from a number of different countries. We've just shown the higher percentages on the right-hand side. There were other countries involved as well, but I just haven't included them on the table. Uh, and from that came 28 competencies. So once again, just reading the first one, domain, basic activities in rheumatology, core theme, history taking and physical examination, or investigations, and those get divided up into individual competencies. Competence number one, elicit a medical a history and perform general physical examination, including the musculoskeletal system. Now, one of the troubles with this process in trying to get agreement and to make it simple, it feels sometimes like you cut everything down to the simplest, simplest possible sentences. And behind that, there is extraordinary detail, of course. And as I work my way through, I'm going to show you in a moment, so these are the other 28, but for each of those competencies, there is a table in the supplementary information. And that table shows the knowledge, skills, and behavior required for that single competence. You can see at the bottom, uh, there's the knowledge, what's described, then there's the skills, other things that might be required, the assessment method, how you should assess this, bottom left, and learning strategies that might be useful as well. So we tried to populate each one of those 28 with a, a user's guide. This is how to do this competence uh, when you're education, educating people. So here's the publication, published in August this year. Uh, an enormous piece of work during a, a trying time for all of us in medical specialities, looking after people uh, with COVID. Uh, it contains the information I, I've mentioned and in, within the supplementary information, uh, also there's lots of detail about this, including what's available in different countries, what's available in different parts of the world, in different medical specialities, the background, the equivalent of the SLR, and then the background information to the production of these competencies. So that's the summary as I come towards the end of talking about uh, the guidelines. One part of a complex jigsaw, which includes good medical graduates, entering into a speciality and enthusing them, standards and competencies to achieve, the diseases we need to know about, all the skills uh, and all the behaviors. And we come back to this final bit, how that leads as many individuals as possible to be competent, good, and as you can see, smiley-faced, happy uh, rheumatologists. Thank you very much for your attention.